depressing or encouraging, I'm not sure <laughs> what, but uh, there's not a day goes by that I do not give thanks for this medicine. I feel that everything interesting and good that's ever happened to me since I got uh, to know it is, uh, is thanks to ayahuasca. So, uh, so here goes. Uh, work. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss is a memoir I wrote a few years ago. You probably know it. Hopefully many of you have read it. And this was uh, a kind of a personal story of my brother and myself. We've been gazing into abysses for quite a while, as you can see, since 1957, <laughs> when we used to go over to the Black Canyon Gunnison, close to where we lived in Paonia, Colorado, only about 30 minutes away. And the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, if you haven't been there, is the deepest gorge in the West. It's narrower than the Grand Canyon, but far more spectacular. So that was our first screaming abyss. And here's the second one. This is the actual brotherhood of the screaming abyss. <laughs> Sitting on a log at La Chirera in 1971 when we decided to go looking for exotic hallucinogens, ayahuasca wasn't really one of them. Uh, OK, here, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we'll beat around too much and don't you want to get excited. Uh, <laughs> So here we are after we just arrived at La Chirera contemplating what is the next step. This was in February of 1971. As you can see, my brother in the middle there is uh, concentrating on doing something he does so well, which is rolling a joint, so that, so that we could uh, then assess our situation. <laughs> and uh, what we were actually looking for, the holy grail of our quest, was not ayahuasca. It was this. It was uh, from Varola species, which is a member of the nutmeg family, used by many tribes to make snuffs. But we were looking for an orally active form of Varola that was used by the Witoto people, and they called it ukuhe. So that was what was motivating us to go to La Chirera in 1971, was the search for uh, this material. Um, and we went there looking for that, and what quickly caught our attention was this, uh, which were growing all over the place. La Chirera was a mission, and there was a pasture. In the pasture, there were Cebu cattle. <coughs> and that's the preferred <coughs> substrate for Psilocybe cubensis. So we quickly got into that and sort of put our concerns about Ukuhe aside for a while. <laughs> and for a long while, actually. And you can re read in the book, or you already know the outcome of that kind of misadventure, but that was, uh, that was what we were doing at La Chirera. So then flash forward uh, 10 years to 1981. I returned to the Amazon, this time as a graduate student at the University of British Columbia, also on a quest for Ukuhe, but in a different place. So maybe I do have to point this out. This kind of orients it. This is La Chirera up there. And then this, this is the Putumayo River that separates Colombia and Peru. And then down here, the town of Pebas and Rio Nuevo and Terra um, Pucorquillo was kind of the second ancestral home, or actually not the ancestral home, but the second home of the Witoto people when they were forced out of La Chirera during the rubber boom. So that's where we ended up doing this, this part of the work. And this time I was a graduate student at the University of British Columbia and collecting plant samples and all this. So this was the part of our adventures that involved the Heraclitus because we had rendezvoused with the Heraclitus uh, in Iquitos. It was in dry dock, it wasn't going anywhere, but we were able to uh, get one of their skiffs, one of their secondary boats, and they brought us down to Pebas, to the mouth of the Rio Ampiyaku, which is known as the River of Poisons. Uh, one of the key people on our expedition was Wade Davis there, that's Wade and I in the Heraclitus boat, uh, and Wade showed up to be the scientific officer uh, for this madcap expedition, and I tell you, it was madcap. 
Terence joined us for a while. He left his wife and uh, three-week-old daughter home and came down to the Amazon to be with us part of that time. So there he is under a kumala tree. The varolas uh, are generically called kumalas. Excuse me, I left my water there. Could you hand it to me? All right, so, um, thank you. Okay, so we had a very successful expedition. We collected all the samples that we wanted and uh, we had fun um, sacrificing a few varola trees to get the samples. Um, and uh, that was that phase. Now I want to back up a little bit because before we started that expedition from Iquitos, my friend Don McCray and myself, also a graduate student, had been in Peru for a few weeks in Pucallpa, and we had gone to visit Don Fidel, who was our first informant about ayahuasca, and our first really uh, serious encounter with ayahuasca. We had Don Fidel's name uh, from a couple of good sources. He proved to be a wonderful first informant. I, I'm sure it was obvious to him how clueless we were, it did not matter. He was kind. He was able to prepare many different batches of ayahuasca for us that we could take home and analyze. So, uh, Don Fidel, may he rest in peace. This is just a quick shot of some of the other uh, famous ayahuascaros from what I call the old school in Iquitos. One of them is Don Emilio Andrade, who was uh, Luis Eduardo Luna's informant. And he also did work in that area a little later than I did. Um, and Eduardo want to send a shout to him. He is, for one thing, the co-editor of this new release of the Ayahuasca Reader. Uh, but also, he's been a part of my life for ever since the beginning, really. And uh, another one is Don Jose Campos, a famous Ayahuascaro of this classical lineage, and he died in, 19, in uh, 2005. There's a picture on the left of Don Jose, age 99. Another fellow I want to mention, I'm still close friends with, and a good, good friend and colleague is Juan Ruiz, who now is the curator of the herbarium in Quitos. At the time, he was only a biology, he was a forestry student, and the director of the herbarium told him to take us down river and make sure these gringos don't kill themselves and get them back in one piece. And he did. And, then, and Juan and I have worked together since on many projects. He is the world's most amazing botanist when it comes to Amazonian plants. Uh, and finally I got all this stuff back to the lab and then I was able to start my lab work. That eventually resulted in a degree in 1984. Uh, and this was the University of British Columbia. There's a couple of key papers that came out of it. Those were the, the two main publications and then a lot of other things sort of spun off from that. So again, fast forward now to 1985. In 1985, Luis Eduardo Luna organized a satellite symposium on ayahuasca in conjunction with the uh, International Congress of the Americanists. They wouldn't let him be part of the mainstream, but they said, yeah, you can do a satellite symposium. So I was invited, and here we are at the Catholic University in Bogota. After that, we went to Florencia, which is uh, Luis Eduardo's ancestral home, met his brother, uh, and encountered a few mushrooms there. Um, yeah, and then, what also happened on that trip was that I, uh, Eduardo and I visited uh, Pucallpa and I introduced him at that time to Pablo Amaringo, the famous Peruvian painter who does the visionary paintings of ayahuasca visions. I had met Pablo in 1981, but we, my Spanish was limited and we hadn't really gotten into a conversation. But at that, but with Eduardo it quickly came to light that he had been an ayahuascaro. And he re remembered his visions perfectly. He wasn't practicing anymore, but he remembered his visions. So he and Eduardo formed an alliance out of which eventually this book manifested, Ayahuasca Visions, the religious iconography of a Peruvian shaman. I think that's still available. 
Uh, and they started a school of painting. They started uh, inviting students from the community to come to Pablo's very humble house and learn how to paint. Not visionary paintings, but amazingly realistic paintings of the jungle, the plants, the animals, and so on. And the uh, thing on the, uh, I guess, my lower right, uh, is the four of us some years later, actually in 1998, because I don't have any images. Well, part of that, after we collected these plants, these live plants, we took them back to San Diego and Eduardo joined us and then eventually took them out to Hawaii, uh, which is where this was taken. Uh, Kat and Terence were just starting botanical dimensions at that time. And we brought the main collections there that are still there. Uh, so that was sort of the seed of the, of the collection of botanical dimensions. Okay, fast forward again to 1991. In 1991, everyone who had published papers or worked in the area of ayahuasca in the last few years were invited by the UDV, the Brazilian religion, to Sao Paulo for a big conference, a medical conference on the medical applications of ayahuasca or potential medical applications. Their agenda was to find out about it, but it was also political. It was to demonstrate to the local authorities that uh, ayahuasca was not harmful, it was not an abused drug, it was basically used in a responsible way. So they invited us, uh, the investigators that were there, to carry out a biomedical study on ayahuasca. And that, interestingly, Eduardo and I had discussed this in 1985 and decided it was impossible because the logistics of doing that in Peru were just, it was not going to work. But under this situation, with many of the people at the UDV being themselves physicians, it was okay, so they invited us to do this, and here we are at the conference. And I should mention at the end of the conference, they had a big convo, they had a, a session in their temple outside Sao Paulo. Five, 500 people were in that, in that session. And that's when I had my vision about photosynthesis which is in the Ayahuasca Reader and also in, in my book, Minds. And it was a really moving vision. I lived sort of in the light of that ever since. So, uh, so flash forward to 1993. We went home from Sao Paulo. I started trying to write a grant to get the money. We eventually got some funding through Botanical Dimensions and Hefter, which was just getting started at that time. And we went back in 1993 to Manaus, to the original uh, Nucleo Calpari, as they, they call them nucleos, they're kind of like a parish. We went to Manaus, which was the original one, and we carried out this biomedical study. And the first thing we had to do in order to do that was to do what they call a preparo. Uh, and they prepare ayahuasca on an industrial scale because they have to make enough of it for 10,000 people to drink every other week. So they have to grow a lot of ayahuasca. Um, UDV was not that big at that time, but it was still 5,000 people. So they made a special batch for our, uh, for our study, and that's what was going on here. And that in itself is a ritual. It takes about 48 hours to prepare it. There's many occasions where it has to be bioassay, of course, to make sure you got the good brew. And that's Glaucus uh, de Souza uh, on, the, on my left there, uh, looking at the glass, and he was about to uh, check it out. Uh, <laughs> so they made, we made the batch, and uh, it was a good batch. And one of the signatures they look at to assess quality, besides actually taking it, is if it has that oily-like sheen on the surface of it, because the beta carbolines are fluorescent. So if they if the sun shines on them, they will fluoresce, and that's another sign that yes, you have the good stuff here. So that's one way. And then we did this study in Manaus in 1993, and uh, we had no place to do it except the temple itself. So we set up shop there. Uh, Eduardo um, Eduardo Luna was not on this study, but. 
Charlie Grove was the principal investigator, and then our friend Jace Calloway, who now resides in Finland, and then our Brazilian colleagues. So we took all sorts of measurements from this experience, which came to be known in legend, I suppose, as the Wasca project. They call it Wasca, which is the Portuguese alliteration of ayahuasca. And uh, I think there are about seven or eight peer-reviewed papers that came out of this. So it was not a waste of time. It was very interesting to do this. Okay, so that was 1991. Okay, now flash forward to like 2004. And by accident and happenstance, I was invited to submit a grant to the Stanley Medical Research Foundation, which studies schizophrenia. And they were interested in natural products and potentially Amazonian traditional medicines that could be used to treat some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. So they gave me a grant. They asked me if I was interested in applying, and I said yes, and they actually funded it. So I had a grant to investigate uh, not ayahuasca, but many of the admixture plants that are used with ayahuasca as possible uh, treatments for cognitive disorders. So it kind of grades over into the whole dementia area. And this was wonderful for me. We did not find a cure for schizophrenia or dementia, but we identified some promising plants. And for me personally, it was an opportunity to reconnect with all my friends in Iquitos, especially Juan Ruiz, who was still there doing his thing, and that sort of started the second phase of my pretty intense uh, involvement with Peru uh, and Iquitos, but also other parts of Peru. So that was a great opportunity to be able to do this. Why they gave me the grant, I have no idea. Here's one of our uh, Alan Shoemaker, some of you may know him as the uh, uh, organizer of the International Conferences on Shamanism. The first one was in 2005, and he was on our crew. He and his wife at the time, Mariella uh, Noriega, were helping with some of our logistics uh, with this expedition. And eventually we even got a paper published out of it, which was sort of the point. So they didn't ask for their money back. Um, they got a paper, which was all that was ever promised. So while all this is going on, I'm really moving kind of fast, but this spans an amount of time, probably from 1990 until the present, when the ayahuasca tourism or pilgrimage phenomenon really sort of went from a trickle of people coming down to see what it's about to now a flood of people. And I personally think that the publication of uh, Eduardo Luna's and Amaringo's book Ayahuasca Visions was really a catalyst, catalytic influence on that because for the first time there was something that was accessible to a wide audience. This book had full color photographs of Pablo's paintings on one page, detailed descriptions in English that Eduardo had written on the facing page. So this was really a window onto the traditional Amazonian cosmology. And as a result of that, it started the, uh, not bad, it's telling me it's all over. Okay, thanks. <laughs> A couple more slides. Uh, so um, I really think that was an influence. It was on many coffee tables, at least in many countercultural households, and made people aware of ayahuasca and made people curious about it. So people started coming to Peru to seek the experience, especially to Iquitos. Iquitos was kind of the epicenter of the ayahuasca tourism phenomenon, and still is, and it's even more chaotic now than it, than it was back then. And also, ayahuascaros started coming to the States. Itinerant superstar ayahuascaros would come to the States and make the rounds. So this is kind of the emergence of ayahuasca onto the global stage. Ayahuasca is going global. <laughs> and uh, in 19, uh, in 2000, no, in 1999, there was a landmark uh, conference at Cathedral Hill Hotel sponsored by CIIS, the first scientific conference on ayahuasca. And so that was also a landmark 
event, and everyone in the, in the field who was interested in ayahuasca uh, was there. And, um, and then also at the same time, Alan Shoemaker was starting these international conferences on shamanism in Iquitos, which were excellent conferences for the first few iterations and then sort of degenerated into not so good. But he was, it was an influence, you know. So, um, what? <laughs> Don't fail me now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that must have been yours. So another <laughs> important and, in my opinion, pivotal event in sort of the whole emergence of psychedelics into this realm of serious discussion and, and possible legitimacy was the Psychedelic Science Conference in Oakland in 2013, which many people call the MAPS Conference. And I have to say, Rick and Maps took the lead there, but Hefter was a sponsor, and so was the Beckley Foundation, and so was the Council on Spiritual Practices and all that. But you know, when Maps is involved, that's pretty much sucks all the root, all the air out. <laughs> and I only mean that in a good way. I mean, I wish we were better marketers, but I really think that this was a pivotal thing because it was a real scientific conference. There was about 1,500 people. Uh, there were three tracks, clinical and experimental. One of the tracks was ayahuasca. And posters, papers, just an excellent conference, and I really think that was a turning point. I mean, in the slide, I think I say coevolution and symbiosis. I don't know if it rises to that level, but coevolution, but why not? You know, that's what's going on. It is coevolution. Um, hmm. This was working before. All right. Uh, what am I doing lately? I've been working uh, with a retreat center down in the Sacred Valley in Peru, Wilcatica, and this shaman here, Waira, is his name, and we've been doing retreats regularly, and we hope to use this as kind of a, I thought of it as a catalytic nexus for global consciousness change, and we hope to do many things there, conferences, uh, retreats, of course, maybe, uh, even some transformational uh, therapeutic work as well. It's the perfect venue uh, for this. It's a beautiful place in the Sacred Valley, which is easily one of the most beautiful places uh, that I've ever seen on the planet. I'm assuming this is not going to cooperate. So just want to say a minute, that's basically the talk. I just want to say, uh, um, I've started a company called Symbio Life Sciences, and that's part of these whole plans for uh, working more closely with Will Katika. And we're actually doing some research as well. So uh, this is, I, this is uh, something I was just told, well, my corporate handlers are here. They said, well, you can just click through this. You don't have to explain it, so I'm not going to. <laughs> if you want to know, you can talk to me or, or David Guy, who kindly made those slides. And uh, um, so that's it. That's my talk. <laughs>